Hello and welcome to the Boffin Buzz, the podcast for anyone fascinated by farming's future. Hello and welcome to the Boffin Buzz and this week we're talking to Clive Blacker who's been in precision farming for Gosh, almost as long as I can remember, I think, uh, Clive. Um, and so he's going to be talking to us about uh, um, precision farming and his um, uh, background in that. And also, we're going to be looking at agri-innovation. And specifically, uh, we're going to be talking about slugs. Uh, so, and um, I've got some things here which I'm going to be, we're going to be talking about, some props. So here we are. You're going to wonder what on earth I'm doing with a, an upturned plant saucer. And we've also got um, a beer mug here, and a cup, um, and another upturned plant saucer here. Well, all will be revealed in good time. Uh, so, uh, welcome, Clive. Uh, good to see you. How, how are you? I'm very well, Tom. Thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Great. Well, now, I want to, because as I say, you know, I've, uh, you've been in precision farming for as long as I've known precision farming exists. Uh, as far as I can remember. So just tell me how it started. How did you get into it in the first place? Oh, and, um, so how I got into it, we started back on the family farm yield mapping in 1998. Um, we had one of the first class lexions with yield mapping, but the, the bit that really sort of stimulated me to how technology could do that sort of thing was on a Bass F open day down at John Fenton's farm on Yeofleet, where he had one of the prototype Massey combines with the GPS on it. and. Uh, um, that must have been in the early 90s and right. um, he was he was actually at a time having to wait for satellites to come over it was that early a time to, well, to well it seemed that you stopped combining wait for the satellite to come over so was, could... yeah if you wanted to map a field a specific field he had to wait for the right time of day so they had enough satellites in the constellation above him yeah. so that he could actually map his field so it was it was quite a, uh, an early adopter of the technology with the early agco field star system yeah i mean i i would imagine you know the probably a lot of farmers out there who, who started back in the early days uh, with the precision farming kit. And for those sort of pioneers, that was a, a bit of, a, a, of an issue that, you know, if when it goes wrong in the middle of your field, you're stuck there, um, trying to get it sorted out on helplines uh, and things like that. Um, uh, and meantime, you know, that downtime, that's time that you could be spraying or combining or whatever. Um, no, Dad used to think he was absolutely crackers. I mean, why would you waste a good combining day to wait for satellites to come over when, when the weather's right? You've got to be on. And, yeah. Um, I was always really taken by it. I thought it was fascinating. And, and you're quite right. The early days, we didn't have, you know, there was no selective availability. So the signals were all scrambled. There were, there were military satellites. Right. And we always, you couldn't use a system without a, a correction source. And we were very lucky in the UK because we had marine beacons all around for, for coastal navigation that offered a, a correction signal and broadcast that. So uh, we were one of the first countries, I think, that could really utilise a correction signal with the military to decrypt the military scrambles. So, so, so you, uh, uh, you started Precision Decisions uh, then? That was, that was the company? No, I didn't start Precision Decisions until 2004. So, right. so the reason we got into yield mapping and things was uh, because we had a, just a huge amount of variability on our farm. Right. So we farm in the Vale of York and uh, it's old uh, alluvial deposits left by glaciers and we don't have the beautiful hilly landscape you've got here uh, in the Vale, it's quite flat, but a, a sort of hill change, the height of the desk in a field, uh, you know, like a metre or two, could mean that you go from sand that would literally blow on a windy day, so that if we were showing sugar beet in there we would under soak with barley, Right. To, to areas of the field that you would in, in winter you would be growing carrots because it was so heavy that the, the, the sugar beet wouldn't grow in there and and that could be in the space of 50 or 60 meters and and it always it always struck me that um you know we were treating the field as a whole so mm -hmm. manganese the whole field got it and it's, i always thought that was stupid we could do a lot less and we could do it smarter and uh if you if you're as unreliable as i am um, remembering to turn things on and off and getting distracted is very easy for me. Um, re remembering to turn it on is one thing, remembering to turn it off is another. It, yeah. it, it was always a challenge. So, you know, technology offering a solution to a, put numbers to those changes and allow you to define a boundary and then and then actually apply to it was, was I thought, a real revelation and a, a huge opportunity for the industry to reduce costs. So uh, what was your first step into providing farmers with a precision farming service and because I seem to remember weren't you involved with uh, Yarra or back in those days it was called Norse Kedro or something? That's right so it yeah. started, I started off as a so, so when we started yield mapping in 1998 
uh, we were also looking at the time at, at different technology to map the canopy and, mm -hmm. and at the time um, InfoTerra and, and some of the early satellite systems with the Surrey satellite systems were were trialling systems that they were looking at putting into space and we got involved in a couple of projects with them and um, looking at using remote sensing as a tool and was there an opportunity and it was such so early days they were they were actually testing different sensors on aircraft at the time right so we actually got some fantastically high resolution imagery with aircraft um, but the problem with the satellites was that you just couldn't rely on it yeah um, we'd also seen that Yara with um, uh, with uh, Rob Rob I forget his name now um, I seem to remember coming to visit you and Rob, and, yeah. and I remember Rob, and I can't remember his name. Yeah, I'm sorry, Rob, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we'll see if we can find out your name and perhaps patch it into the um, uh, right. podcast a bit later on. Ages uh, true. But um, uh, if you're listening, Rob, um, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, a real stimulator. He, and he had a boom system, so Yara developed a boom sensor yes. that was on the front of the tractor cab, and uh, yeah. I think Rob was, um, Rob was one of the guys that, that used that to start mm. with. And, so was that the precursor to the end sensor? That's right, right. Yeah. yeah. So the first one was looking down straight down into the canopy. That's it. Um, the challenge that you have with that sort of technology is that you only see a small area when you look directly down into it. Yeah. Um, so it makes it a lot harder to get a good estimation of what's in a crop or in an area. Um, but the other, you know, the other challenge is why would you want a boom on the front of a tractor that's when you're doing fertilizer spreading? It was, a, it was a bit of a hindrance. Yeah. So the, the whole technology was sort of redeveloped to have an oblique view so it could look down sideways into the canopy. And that's when so, it went up onto the canopy. that's when it went onto what the original precursor was, the, the coffin as we called it. it was, yes. It was a great Quite big, a big thing, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. It was huge, 55 kilos of metal on top of the cab wow. roof. That, um, was a horrible thing to, to operate and use, but very leading at its time. Yeah. Again, that was working on early, some of the early precursor software that Fieldstar developed with the Fieldstar tech terminals. So ah, that's the John Deere. That was the no, that was all Massey Ferguson. Oh, sorry, that's yeah. Massey Ferguson, yeah. right? Um, so, uh, what was the what was the John Deere? The, the John Deere system is the remind so me. Green Star. So Green Star. That didn't, come, that didn't come until a few years later. Yeah. But, um, so we got involved in the early days with that technology, and obviously the advantage of having a a cab mounted sensor was that we could get imagery every time we went through the crop. Yeah. So that, that um, you know, Yara would always have said that, that um, remote sensing offers the opportunity to see large areas and, and do that very, very quickly. So it's really attractive, but then you've got issues with cloud and the ability to capture those images. Mm. If that's going to compromise the timeliness of an application, well, timeliness is the most important thing to get right. And if we're going to get it right, then we can't, we can't compromise timeliness. Yeah. So, so that the only way we can guarantee our timely factor is, is to have a sensor that we developed ourselves. I and, see. And Yara are not a technology company, you know. So for them to, mm. them to look into that development um, was was really quite pioneering. Well, it's uh, I mean, you know, they've um, they've really sort of pioneered the the end sensor. And yeah, so back in those days, you were. Um, uh, setting people up with the end sensor is that uh, no that didn't start till 2002 so I was right. a, uh, so we started with that in 1999 was our first year with that we we worked with them for two or three years um, um, as, as a farmer as a farmer and grower and we right. justified it we did some of the early trial work with them oh, so we proved that we proved the benefit of variable rate nitrogen on our own farm and built the use case for ourselves that that then allowed us to purchase and buy into that technology I see. And as one of the early adopters of the technology, then Yara approached me in 2002 to ask if I would become a sort of end sensor ambassador for them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, speak to other farmers. And that's really where I got started then uh, in, a, in a sort of support role and, and role helping other farmers. I see. And, and at the same time, we were actually contractors for SOYL. We, would, we had front and back spreaders on our on a tractor. And, and we were supporting um, some agronomy businesses going around who were doing the soil analysis to then do the variable rate application. So that's a very different technology, um, what soil use. So, so just right. um, explain what the difference is there. So the difference is in the technology. So, so one, one looks at using soil analysis and soil yeah. testing to measure the variability of the soil based on, on lab analysis. Yeah. And then based on that, on, on that variability that our soils have in terms of the amount of nutrient they can store, we can then target and variably apply, uh, in this case, potash, phosphate, phosphate yes. uh, uh, magnesium and lime. Um, and lime being the most important. The lime's the thing you've got to get right. If you get the lime right, then other things will fall into place. Uh, but what that allowed us to do is then uh, use variable applications that put the, the system into place. Typically with the soil stuff, you it was historic. So, mm. so you sample once and that will last you for four seasons. 
Whereas the, the technology that the end sensor had that, that always uh, really struck my imagination was the fact that it, it gives you the opportunity to target and change something within that growing season. Yeah, so you can within, respond to the variance that. But, yeah, within the field at the time, and it's, it's literally sort of just in time uh, technology. Or, uh, real, time, real, real time, time yeah. real time applications. Real time applications, absolutely. It's there making a decision as you go through the field and, and then variably applying those application rates. Yeah. Now, as, as I understand it, the where we're at with, with that particular technology now. Um, is that um, uh, it will actually there's the absolute end thing where where you literally just put your life in the hands of, of the end sensor and, and it decides um, uh, what rate to spray that um, yeah. uh, and um, you just put your trust your, your faith in it absolutely because uh, normally you would sort of set a, a maximum and a minimum wouldn't you and it would That's vary right. between that uh, but with absolute end uh, it, it does all the thinking for you. I mean, you know, the robots are taking over. Uh, well, is, is it technology? They are, to some extent, but they are, but it, it, you know, it's using proper science. Yeah. Now, people are always very sceptical of Yara and their approach because they're saying, well, why would a fertilizer company develop technology that will help me apply fertilizer? Yeah. Surely it's going to uh, apply more fertilizer than, than I want to and make Yara more money because they're going to sell me more fertilizer. Yeah. Um, the end sensor development team in Hanninghoff. Um, they're, they're, they're removed from the commercial team. You know, their role is to, to find the best solutions for applying nitrogen to make sure that, that we as consumers of, of fertilizer, that we as suppliers of food, have a, have a technology and a, uh, a system in place that's there to support accurate applications of nitrogen that mean that we can use it responsibly, that mm -hmm. we aren't polluting water courses or wasting product that means then that we can justify the use of the product for longer periods of time and that legislation then uh, should, shouldn't have to interfere with stopping farmers making bad decisions and polluting. Okay, so that's what we're setting out to do, but in practice, does it work, yeah, I guess? I mean, does, you know, so in, yeah. I mean, you must have um, been to loads of farmers and, and, and seen farms and set them up with, these, with this kit and so on. Um, uh, is it a case of nitrogen savings? Is it going on more accurately? Is it actually working? Yeah, so, so the, the, the sort of system with the end sensor that you would see is that there's a, there's a saving in nitrogen in some cases. Yeah. So depending on the operation mode you want to use it in, it's very diverse in how you can use that. Um, but the, so there's a saving in nitrogen, particularly if you use some of the absolute modes. And, mm. and I have a lot of arguments with farmers over the years about, well, it's not recommending to put anything on. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's alien. That's not what we've been told. You know, it's the opposite argument to right. what we'd expect. So, 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 so the, the surprise there is that it's actually putting less on. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. And it's saying, it, I would normally put two bags of fertilizer on here. And, and this is saying that it only needs half a bag or don't put any on at all. And, and I, don't, I don't think that's right. Yeah. I don't trust it. No, yeah. interesting. Oh, now, uh, 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 I want to move to another technology, um, uh, which is really the main thing that we're talking about, um, which is ECN scanning. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, uh, tell me, you know, how did you get into that? And well, just explain, first of all, what the technology is. So the, the technology, it's a technique we use for mapping soil textual variability. Right. So, so if we think about precision farming, we, we've got a number of different variables that can occur within, within our growing crop. Part of that is, a, is something that we can manipulate in terms of the inputs of nitrogen or, or fer fertilizers yep, and, and, been talking about, and yeah. respond to the crop as it grows. The other part is obviously the medium it grows in, which is our soils. And if our soils are variable, then we need to understand that variability. If we've got variable emergence, if we've got variable soil texture, mm. that would mean we have different storage capacities for nutrients or different bug or bugs or pest pressures that can occur, different weed burdens. Yeah. So being able to digitally map those gives us an ability to, to then be able to put physical numbers to, to those changes that allow us then to create different intervention strategies for herbicides, for pre-emergence, post-emergence, for, uh, for slug pellets or for, for, for different uh, management opportunities and even seed rates that can allow us to, to implement a number of different cultural and, and management control systems that can actually influence yield and make sure that we justify uh, having a decent crop at harvest. Yeah, so we'll, we'll come to slug pellets in, in a bit, but just talk me through, I mean, how does it actually work? Because I've, I've seen your kit, okay, and it's like this big long pole um, with a bit of, um, with a tube on it, um, and you just go through the field uh, and it comes up with this data. I mean, how does it work? So the, the system is it's non-invasive, so it doesn't touch the soil. Right. Uh, essentially, what it is, is a, is a big radio transmitter at one end, 
So it's, it's, it's producing an electromagnetic field with a transmitter at, at one end of the receiver that's near the, near the back of the, uh, the bike that we pull it with. Yeah. And then down the tube, as you could describe, um, and it does, it does just like a downpipe. Yeah. Um, there, there's different transmitter, there's different receivers um, that are picking up the signal from uh, the transmitter. And within the, rece the receiver coil, some are, some are mounted horizontally and some are mounted vertically. And they can then pick up different depths of, of the, um, the signal within the soil. Well, so it bounces the signal into the soil and then... Yeah. And, then and the oh, different depths, of, of, uh, depending how far away they are and the orientation of them, will then measure a different profile of the soil. So uh, it obviously comes back with a different signal for sand or gravel or whatever than yeah. from, from clay. Uh, so so what's, it, what's it actually reading? Yeah, so the electrical current through the soil is what it reads. So it reads two things. One's, one's magnetic induction. Yeah. And the other is electrical impedance. So, so as we see differences in soil texture, what we have is, is, is essentially changes in moisture. And it's that moisture component of the soil that we're actually measuring. Right. So we will see values change as soils dry out or, or get wetter. You can see those values go up and down. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, sure so, that just throw, throws the figures, doesn't it? Well, it, so you, there can be calibration problems if you, yes, yes. So yeah. the, the, fi the best thing to do if you're going to do your farm is to do it all at once. Right, I see. To do everything at the same time, otherwise we have to adjust figures and, and, and set up a field reference. Um, and we can come back to that reference and then we can adjust others to, to look. So, so if you see a lot of EC maps or electroconductivity maps, they often don't have numbers with them because, right. because that might have been hidden by your supplier. I see. So they'll call it heavy or light or they'll call it, they don't normally put the numbers to it because, because of the drift factor that can occur because of seasonal variations. I see, okay. So um, uh, now we'll, we'll come to what you were specifically doing uh, today in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you, so you've mapped three of my fields. Yeah, uh, we've done three of your fields. The, the technology that we've used, typically we're just using the conductivity information. So, yeah. so that will give us an indication of the variability of the soil moisture, which we can then deduce back to soil texture. Yeah. So we can then see that the, that the areas that are and maybe shallow sands or that are quite gravelly that, that have very little conductance because they don't hold much water versus a clay that, that holds a lot more moisture uh, and will have a higher conductivity reading. So uh, you, uh, you looked at three of my fields. Yeah. Uh, there was a big ground uh, and then there's a little Newbury and then there's Beach Clump Hill. Was the, was the third one. Uh, so they're three quite different fields. Um, uh, so just talk me through, so big ground first of all, uh, what did you find in there? So big ground other than the sheep that were roaming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, um, it was great to see some live but, but, but did, did they, uh, was it okay to scan them with the, with the yeah, sheep? Yeah, the sheep, the sheep were, weren't bothered by me. Right. They, they obviously uh, have, have been very well fed because normally when you go in the field of sheep, they follow you around thinking they're going to get a free lunch. But yeah, that's my age 15. Lucky. They've been chopping away on that. I was very lucky that they, they just left me alone, so yeah. um, there was no problem with that. I mean, what we found in there was that's probably, that's probably got some of your lightest or, or stoniest soils. Right. Yeah, um, no, that figures. The conductivity in there was probably at its lowest uh, uh, across the whole farm. Well, so when it goes over stony, because there's a, like a brash um, belt that goes through there, um, that that's, um, shows up as very, very light, does it? Yes, yeah, so it says very, there's not a lot of conductive. So because you've got right. stone, it doesn't hold any moisture. So, so the, the electrical signal is virtually near zero. Yeah. You know, so there were very, very low values in there. Um, on, on one bank side, you could see there was a, a clay cap. Yeah. Um, and that showed in, in two of the different profiles. I can only see two of the four mm. profiles that we capture uh, on, on the screen in the cab. Right. Um, but you could see that there was clay to some depth in there as well. So, so and you know, and that's obviously where you've got your slug trap as well. So that's it. That Absolutely. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, as I say, we'll come to the slugs in a minute. But uh, now, uh, talk to me about Little Newbury because my feeling of Little Newbury is uh, it's it's some of the heaviest um, soil that we've got on the farm, or at least at one end it is anyway. Yeah. Certainly, the end furthest away down nearest the wood was the heaviest that's it. end. Yeah. Whether that's some spoil that could have come out of the old railway line or something that's been put there over time, I don't know. It's, it's always been very heavy. I mean, I think it is proper Oxford clay, yeah. um, uh, so uh, and hasn't been ever been properly drained. So uh, yeah, but of, of the three fields I've scanned, that one that one was probably your least variable. Oh right. So I think that one was fairly consistent. Other than that top end, that yeah. top end that you mentioned near that wood, 
that that was a, a clearly a different sole texture. But there there is a bit of brash through there at the, a, a, yeah, the, the veneer bits, end. Yeah, but not not to the same level I think as as, as the other two fields. Right, I see. And then uh, finally, beach clump. Um, now, oh. uh, uh, my impression of beach clump is it's one of the most variable on the farm. And I would agree. Got... Oh really? Oh, yeah. oh good, good. Because there's. Well, you, I'll tell you my impression of the field, and then you tell me what you saw on the on the scan. So um, uh, there's sand up at the top yeah. uh, in a sort of top triangle. So if if you've got like a square, uh, if it was a square field, then um, through the middle, sort of diagonally, there's this clay, a belt of clay that's absolutely a appalling to try and cultivate. Um, then at the top there's sand, which yeah. is a joy, and at the bottom there's, well Dad always used to say it's the best part of the whole farm uh, down there, but uh, I've literally got like a, an acre of it uh, across the whole farm. <laughs> I wish the whole farm was like it, it's yeah. lovely. Um, uh, but uh, is that what you found? It is, it, uh, I mean to be honest it looked very much like a, um, an RAF symbol. So if you imagine that, oh, so right in the centre was a great big blue circle of, yeah. of the heavy clay that you've described, and then yeah. at the top end, the, the fringe at the top was all uh, lighter, yeah. so it was a lot redder colours, and then the bottom was yellow, and um, there was some body in there, but yeah. not, not light. Right, oh, that's interesting to say. So the main thing that we want to talk about is um, uh, the Slimers yes. uh, project. So that's uh, strategies leading to improved management and enhanced resilience against slugs. It's a three-year, £2.6 million uh, DEFRA-funded project. Um, uh, and um, uh, as many of you will know, Boffin is leading that project and um, Aggravation is, is also one of the partners uh, within it. Uh, so the reason that Clive was here today scanning my fields is that we are setting up uh, for the first set of field trials this year. Um, and we are looking for 30 slugs. So, well, we, we just about found all of our 30 slug sleeves now. Um, uh, and Clive is going around scanning all of their fields. And that is why we are so interested in the variability of the soils. So do you want to talk me through um, what it is, uh, you know, that, so how you relate the variability of the soils to what we're aiming to do with the project? Yeah, so the, the aim of the project, Harper Adams have got a, a, log, a logarithm that they've dis, dis, defined over the years. They think, they think by understanding the soil physical properties and then by looking at some, some chemical analysis of the soil within nutrients and within organic structure and within uh, the acidity of the soil, that they can predict with a level of accuracy where slugs will occur and won't occur on a field. Right. So if we can understand the physical variation, with, which is what we're achieving with the electroconductivity mapping, we can put a baseline number to, to some of those factors for them. And it will allow us to put in our trials when we set the, the, the quite comprehensive. I don't think I've ever mapped anything quite as comprehensively as we're aiming to do with this project. It's, right. it's very ambitious. Um, um, with a level of certainty, both so that we can we can accommodate both text soil textual variability and then the chemical variability. Measure that when we do the analytics. Right. Uh, so, so talk me through. So we, uh, we've already talked about the ECN scanning that you're doing. Yeah. Um, uh, and we talked about the results you're going to get from that. So, what other um, uh, scanning are we going to be doing for these? Plots. Well, so so initially, in, so the first the first step is is to do the conductivity and assessment, so we understand the physical variation. Yeah. Then we're going to work with each of the growers and define where they think their their most trusted slug patch areas are, and then what what we're aiming to achieve is then to put in a, a hectare grid, yeah, uh, or a hectare a hectare block, where we're then going to put a hundred measurement points. That's a hundred measurement points. A hundred measurement points. Right. So one every ten meters. Yeah. So uh, and when we're talking about measurement points, uh, and now we're going to come to our um, our props. So it's these. So this is a um, well, it's a plant pot saucer basically, um, but it's a slug refuse trap, um, and. Uh, and so what are you going to be, you're going to be putting a hundred of these down in, in each of these 30 farmers fields. So, so I've got an, an unenviable task <laughs> of, of firstly defining where they're going to go in the field with the farmers and, and with the help of Keith at Harper Adams. Yeah. Sorry, this is Keith Waters, isn't That's it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And with, with, the, uh, with both their inputs, then we'll define where we're going to put these plots. Then we've got to lay the, the traps out. Yeah. Um, and essentially what we're going to do is put one every, on every square of 10, 10 metres. Yeah. Um, and we will do a plant, uh, a, a soil analytical sample of that point as well. So we'll take one soil core from each point. 
so that Harper can verify that within their labs to do the chemical and uh, organic matter analysis of that. So I've never, I've never mapped something so intensively in a field yeah. in one hectare. And that's why I'm quite keen to try and find it in a variable part of the field so that we've got both extremes so we can test, we can test Harper's theory. Right. So uh, have I got a suitable spot in, in my field? Absolutely, yeah. Right. No, well, clearly. I look forward to it. And, and so, so just to get this clear, you're going to be putting 100 of these traps down and then you're going to be taking 100 soil samples as well. 100 right? soil samples as well. Right. That's a, that's a lot of traps and that's over 30 farms. We've got the thick end of 3,000 3, plots to put out. <laughs> That's going to be uh, that's going to be a lot of data actually, and then uh, so we are as I say we've got thirty slug sleuths um, uh, that uh, Boffin has contracted to do the work, um, and they're, they're they're being paid to uh, um, set up the trial and monitor it. Well, Clive's setting up the trial, but they're they're going to be paid to um, to monitor the trial, um, and I think it's it's going out um, once a week for five weeks um, and just inspecting the trap seeing how many, we're looking for grey field slugs, I think, aren't we? That's right, yeah. Um, uh, seeing how many uh, slugs there are in there and then capturing that. We've got a, uh, an app on a, um, uh, on, a, on a phone like this, uh, the, the Husk app, where we're going to be recording um, the, um, uh, the, all the data which we'll go through. And, um, you know, thank God, because it's going to be a hell of a lot of data uh, to manage, isn't it? That's going to be Keith's job, I guess. To well, we're going to pull the data example. together. I mean, we're, I'll log all the GPS positions of each of the slug traps as well as we lay them out with, a, with an RTK system. Yeah. Um, so we know exactly where they all are. And then, and then at some point, I'm hoping to also fly all the sites with a drone so we can get an, understand, yeah. a, an understanding of the variability of the canopy and see if that matches what we expect to see from the slug patches that the farmers have described at the start of the season and see if that's got an influence to the green area index or the, the leaf area of the crop. Yeah, because the farmers will be, they'll be going into the, in, into the crop every week and doing some monitoring. Um, and we are going to be asking them to look at the growth of, of the crop. But um, the, uh, one of the problems we've had in a previous uh, trial is that um, where we asked uh, farmers the growth score, of course, it's a very um, subjective uh, score. Uh, and um, so, you know, one person's six is another person's three. Uh, so um, uh, this time round, we're, again, we're going to be recording uh, photos on the on the on the husk app um, uh, that we can then analyse, um, you know, either by by eye or perhaps even get some AI uh, or something to analyse it. Uh, it would be that... an ideal job for machine learning if we can calibrate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one of the ambitions of the project. As you said, it's a very ambitious project overall. So uh, now we're, we're also looking at, and this is a, a new thing, um, at, at beetles as well, and hence why we've got these other props here. Um, so um, uh, everyone's wondering why on earth I've got this beer mug uh, here. Uh, so um, uh, Clive, do you want to explain what we're doing with this? Yeah, so essentially what we're going to put, put in the field is some uh, 20 beetle traps within the, within the hectare grid. Yeah. Um, and that's going to allow us the ability to, to then monitor the beetle population as well uh, on, on some of the selected sites. We're not going to do this on all of the sites, we're only going to do this on a selection of them. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, that those who volunteer for it, uh, so the, the farmers are being paid uh, to monitor the slugs. Um, so this is an extra part of the project um, and those who want to. Uh, we know that a lot of um, farmers are interested in the beetle populations in their field and just how much that's contributing to slug control. So that's why we're, we're, um, we're looking to, uh, to trap the beetles. And as far as I understand, so this goes into the soil, doesn't it, Clive? That's right. So the, the pint glass essentially becomes a, a whole liner yeah. um, that allows us then to put in a, another vessel that allows us then to capture the, the, uh, the beetles that yeah. fall into there without actually um, allowing the size to cave in and, and cause us problems. Yeah, uh, what I also explained since we're on the podcast is uh, what I've got here is, 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 is a plastic uh, pint beaker uh, and that sits in the soil. The idea is you bury it so that um, the beetle comes along and then just falls into the beaker. Um, uh, but it's so that we can actually, um, uh, uh, you know, check it regularly, uh, we've got a second beaker that sits inside it um, that you then take out um, and the beetles fall in here. Now, one of the sad things about this, uh, Clive, is that um, what we've got to do is put some water or, or ethanol uh, in the beaker so that when they fall in, they basically drown. Um, uh, because if, if we just let them roam around in there, then they'll eat each other uh, and you'll come to your trap and it'll look a bit, um, uh, uh, 
Um, well, uh, God knows what it'll look like. Uh, but um, uh, so the uh, um, uh, it's going to be dead beetles. We're going to be killing beetles. We're going to be killing a lot of beetles in fields, actually. Uh, but it's all for science, so it's all good, uh, I guess. And then uh, uh, what's uh, uh, just to explain what this is for then. So this is, this is basically a little hat that sits over the trap to protect it from filling with rainwater and becoming a rain gauge. Yeah. Um, and it, it just provides a bit of cover over the surface of it so that it doesn't get any debris or other things in there. Yeah, so just to explain, this is another one of these plant sources. It is, it, it'll, it, it'll do as a, a slug trap as well. And we're numbering all of these uh, so that we can then record uh, and again capture even more data. Now, of course, one thing that's, um, uh, that we probably haven't spoken about is this little fella here who's a, who's a slug. Uh, so if, uh, if you're watching this, you can see that he pops his eyes out like that. Um, and this is our special Slimers mascot. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about was um, uh, moving away from slugs now uh, into... Uh, I know that you're involved in quite a few other uh, of these um, farming innovation pathways uh, projects. And I didn't know whether you wanted to tell us a little bit about uh, any of the other projects you're involved in. Oh, well, I've been very lucky uh, over the years to be involved in quite a number of different Innovate UK projects and, um, you know, I would, I would stress to any farmer that might be listening to this that, that you know, Innovate UK are, are putting money available if you've got an idea that, that you would like to explore on your own farm. Innovate has got a mechanism in which they can provide you funds to, to then explore that idea and, and work with a, a researcher or, or, or a body to, to prove the concept or the daft idea you might have and, mm. and look at how you can take that forward. And I would seriously recommend to anybody to, to have a go at it. It's, it's, um, it, gives you, it gives you the knowledge on something that that's been, might have been bothering you and niggling you for years to be able to then maybe build the next new uh, IT system or, or development that, that will revolutionise not just your farm but other farms as well. Well, I, and hopefully that would um, ring a bell with a lot of um, Boffin members because, I mean, that's what Boffin is all about, uh, representing farmers who do their own on-farm trials. Um, and that's always, been, that's always been a thing, really, in farming, isn't it? That if you're the first person to make that move, you know, to, to do that, that uh, and thinking back to those precision pioneers, as I say, those guys who spent all that time in the field trying to work out how it would work, probably missing their spray timings as a result and so on. You know, uh, um, uh, uh, they put in all the hard work to get to the, where the technology is now, um, and they don't actually get a reward from it at all, do they? Well, they're only their own benefit from what they achieve on their own farm at yeah. home and, and the financial, or the, the learning benefits they get. Well, that's why we've always been keen at Boffin, to the, the farmers who do their own on-farm trials uh, get paid for it. But as you say, Clive, there is now, you know, Innovate UK have got funds available yeah, to Yeah, so there, there's a number of different projects that, that they've recently funded, and another one that I'm involved with is all around um, nitrogen use efficiency. We're looking at how, in, in this stage in a wheat crop, we can firstly measure the nitrogen use efficiency of our wheat, uh, which we think is really important. So if we can measure it, then then we can potentially understand how effectively we're using it and get the best out of it. So how, how do you measure nitrogen use efficiency? I, my, my perception is that the only way you can do it uh, is at the end of the season, once you've taken your yield off and so on, um, look back. But that's not really going to help you in the season, is it? No, no, it isn't. Um, but, you know, it, it is vitally important and it is something that we should all be doing because it's quite horrifying. So when you start putting numbers to your performance and, and looking at what you, what you apply and what you remove, um, it, if we're not measuring that, I'm staggered it's not been a, a metric we, we've not used as an industry for years. Right. You know, it, should be, it should be an industry default measurement because when I first started looking at my fertilizer recovery, so, so there's two different methods in which you can, well, there's a number of different methods in which you can calculate nitrogen use efficiency. The easiest one to cal ca capture is your fertilizer recovery. And, and you really don't need any other data than probably what you've already got in, in some cases. So all you would need to know is how much total nitrogen you've applied to your crop yeah. to calculate the total applied. And then we need to work out how much you've removed. And how we do that is we calculate how much yield we, we took off and what's the grain protein of that uh, crop. Right. So if you've got grain protein an analytics from a lab for milling wheat or you've had your wheat tested and a lot of a lot of grain merchants will do you a, a very quick NIR test in their labs that can give you that data. With those three bits of information, you can look at your fertilizer recovery efficiency. Right. And so is that what you're exploring in, in this project? Then? No, we, we're taking that a, a lot further. So, yeah. so the project, the project is a, it's a four-year project. It's a, a, again, it's a, a, just over a £2 million project. 
that's being funded by Innovate UK. We've got 13 partners uh, and we're exploring a number of different things. So, so firstly, we're looking at full nitrogen use efficiency. So to calculate full nitrogen use efficiency, we have to test the soil. Right. Now that isn't something that a lot of farmers do. It's always been expensive. It's always been dismissed as, uh, as random. So sorry, this is the NMIN test, is that? That's right. Yeah. So, so we work with, we're specifically uh, our project partner that, to cover the soil analytics is Hillcourt Farm Research yeah. with Dr. Uh, Mechtel Blakehouse. Uh, and Mechtel is doing all the analytics there and we're doing a 0 to 30 nitrogen measurement and a 30 to 60 measurement. And you'll have seen the sampler on the side of the buggy that, that I've had today. Yeah. That's for taking those cores. Um, and, and what Mechtel does is she'll give us the available nitrogen that's in the soil now. Yeah. So that the, the truly available, that, that's plant available at, at, on the day we take the samples. But she will also do quite an innovative sample around the incubation of that soil in the top 30 to work out what potentially might become mineralized if we get the right conditions within the season. So we have an idea of how big that bank of nitrogen that, that could potentially become available to the crop through the growing season uh, is as well. So, so going back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, uh, there's slightly crude measurements of, of nitrogen, and, and I guess you can do that over your whole farm. Yes. Uh, and it will give you an idea of nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, so um, what sort of percentages uh, would an average farm... Uh, so when I first started looking at this, and the bit that horrified me was when I first looked at my first uh, nitrogen uh, fer or fertilizer recovery efficiency, I was only fifty per six percent recovery efficient. Wow, fifty six percent. So hang on. So if you put a hundred kilograms of nitrogen on, and we apply a lot more than that, yeah, um, then you're only that you're only taking using fifty six percent. The rest of it. Presumably, it just goes it's into in the environment somewhere. It's either yeah. in the soil, so it's either it's either held in the bank of soil, it, yeah. it's either leached or, or available to, to to the water course, or it volatilizes into the air. And uh, just uh, so uh, presumably, you know, some of the best farmers are, have got better efficiency, and some of the worst farmers are even worse. Absolutely. So, and yeah. if we're not measuring this, then how do we? You know, if if we're looking at a political structure longer term. And we can't measure our use efficiency, then and, and, and policy dictates that we have to reduce nitrogen. Mm. My argument would be: well, let's let's measure it. And let's not penalise those that are doing a really good job, and let's penalise the ones that aren't doing a good job, yeah. and put some metrics in place to allow us to do that responsibly. So, what's the secret to improving your nitrogen use efficiency? Well, that's one of the projects that prompt project aim. So, right. we're looking at combining new technologies and new science. So, so we're combining the great work that Mechtel is doing with the soil science and, and, and we're working with a, a startup business that's developing soil sensors. Oh, right. So we, we will have a soil sensor system in place that we put a probe in the ground that will measure our, our soil moisture, our soil temperature and our, and our nitrogen. That's so who, who, who's the, uh, the, the, what company has got the... Um, so this is, this is technology that was originally developed through PBL over at the Rosling and, and John Innes and yep. Sainsbury Laboratories over at Norwich Research Park. Uh, that PBL are commercialising with a company called Dell's Lamnet who've, who've developed a prototype sensor. Right, well this, the, I love a gadget, Clive, you know me. So this sounds really exciting. So we're going to have sensors in our soil that are going to be telling us um, our nitrogen use efficiency, basically. Well, they will tell us our soil supply of nitrogen, they'll tell us our soil moisture supply, and they'll tell us our soil temperature. Yeah. And we'll be able to correlate that information with the data we get back from the lab with Mechtel, and they'll give us a proportion of an understanding of what's going on in the soil every 15 minutes uh, for the whole crop cycle. So have you got farmers involved in this project then? Yes, we've currently, we've, we've just done trials this season. We've had 43 different uh, farmers involved on wow. 53 different sites. We've taken 106 different nitrogen samples twice, so we've done it pre-application uh, pre of nitrogen in February, March, and we're just doing it, uh, or we've just completed post-harvest analysis now, uh, and that's, that's data that we've just taken to the lab at the moment. Uh, and that's, so those were all those samples I saw in the back of your land room? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, I see. Fascinating. It's, it's quite horrifying. So, so let me, let me paint, paint a picture for you, yeah. Tom. Last season in one of the trial sites, before we had the project, so I did soil analysis on the farm in February. We had 45 kilos of N available to the crop. Mm. Uh, we applied 216 kilos of N to the crop, and we removed 203 kilos in, in terms of the grain that we removed and the grain protein. Right, okay. So that gave me a fertilizer recovery of 93%. It gave me a fertilizer use efficiency of somewhere just over 75%, I think it was. Right. So I was really pleased with that. Yeah. 
But then I was quite horrified when I did a deep soil core after harvest yeah. because I had 125 kilos of N available in the soil. Oh my God, what? So there's still 125 kilogo, kilos available um, in the soil that just hadn't been taken up? Yeah, that had mineralised or an additional source that had appeared. Right. And that, so that's why we've introduced Megteld with a additionally available nitrogen. And yeah. We're also working with a, a company called uh, Assimilar who are looking at remote sensing. So, so they're going to monitor the crop with a crop model and every day they can give us a new yield forecast and give us a yield potential. Uh, mm. and, and as we get satellite SAR satellite data, so synthetic aperture radar or uh, optical oh, that's data. stuff that see through the clouds. See through the cloud. Yeah. And we can then build a canopy picture of how that canopy is developing that will allow us to influence our timing. I see. Um, I better mention some of the other partners so they don't get grumpy. So yeah. we're working with retailers, uh, with Kellogg's through, and, and uh, potentially others through Duncan Rawson at EFFP. Right. Uh, Agreed Earth are involved. They're looking at how we can potentially bring new income streams in for farmers that are, are reducing nitrogen applications that might have a, a green benefit for water courses. Or oh, well, so farmers being paid to reduce their nitrogen? Potentially, or, or wow. to put policy well, in place or procedures in place that might help absorb this additional nitrogen that yeah, we might find. So it doesn't go into the waterways, I guess. Um, yeah, it's a you know it's a challenge. We're trying to trying to do things properly. That sounds um, fantastic. We've got Lincoln University involved. They're looking at sensor development and they're going to do a lot of NOx measurements and, and allow us to build a full three-dimensional nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide. Yeah. So we can build a three-dimensional sort of crop model uh, and verify the, the losses from different in interventions. We've got um, ag analysts who are doing the data platform. Right. So they're going to build the, the platform that the farmers can interface with. I've mentioned Mechteld, I've mentioned Dales Landnet. We've got three different farmers involved that, that are, are project guidance partners. Right. They're Velcourt, Dyson, and and, uh, and Blacker and Sub. Right. Um, and we also have Alison Grundy, who was the uh, oh, yes. from Compass Agronomy, and they're developing a, a bit of software that will allow farmers to meet the compliance regulations. Fantastic. So hopefully I haven't forgotten anybody. <laughs> Great. Well, no, listen, that sounds fantastic. And, and I think that's just about all we've got time for. But look, Clive, thank you so much uh, for coming in uh, and telling us all about um, you know, your history and precision farming and what you're up to at the moment. And of course, um, the Slimers project uh, as well. So anyone can get involved in Slimers. We have uh, just about got our 30 slug sleeves for, for our trials this year, but uh, we are looking for volunteer slug scouts. Uh, who can go out and find slugs, trap them on their farm, greyfield slugs we're looking for, and send them into John Innes Centre for, um, for feeding trials, uh, so that we can, because uh, uh, I, I, I haven't told you about our slug resistant wheat live, uh, but that's a project that you can find out about on our website, um, where we're at to with slug resistant wheat. That's what we're, we're uh, looking at, at John, with John Innes Centre. Um, so you can get involved in that. There's also the slug circle as well, and you'll find that on the farming forum. Uh, so if you go onto the farming forum and look in the knowledge and farming section, then you'll find the slug circle in there. And that's where the conversation is just getting underway uh, on slimers and all things to do with slugs. So look, listen, Clive, thank you again for coming in uh, and uh, talking us through uh, everything that you're, you're up to. Um, we'll be back again. Uh, just listen out for us. Don't forget to, um, to stay tuned uh, to the boffin buzz. Uh, but uh, that's all from us for the moment. Goodbye. Cheerio.